amen. If you have your Bibles, would you turn with us to James, the epistle James. Amen. We're going to look at the second chapter, verses 14 to 26. James chapter 2, verses 14 to 26. It's in the back. Amen. When you hit Hebrews, you're almost there. Amen. It's after Hebrews. Amen. James chapter 2, verses 14 to, through 26. When you have it, would you please signify by standing to your feet? For those who do not have their Bibles, do not worry. We have it on the screens here. James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. The New Living Translation of the Scripture reads as follows. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions, can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or a sister who has no food or clothing, and you say goodbye and have a good day. Stay warm and eat well. But then you give that person, you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see. Faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now, someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God, good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. And so it happened just as the scriptures say, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He was even called the friend of God. So you see, we are shown to be right by God by what we do, not by faith alone. Rahab, the prostitute, is another example. She was shown to be right by God, right with God by her actions when she hid those messengers and sent them safely away by a different road. Just as a body is dead without breath, so also is faith dead without good works. Thus far, the word of God, you may be seated. Amen. Amen. I'm excited about today's sermon. Amen. Satisfying a steward's debt of love, part eight. Amen. Amen. You know, last week when we came together, we talked about uh, looking by using the scripture with the 99 sheep, with 100 sheep, and the shepherd leaving the 99 going to find the one. That uh, Christian faith is not simply Christian discipleship. Christian discipleship is learning what faith is. A disciple is a student, he's learning the discipline. And discipline is not what your mother or father did to you with the belt, or the switch, or the electric iron, uh, iron, electric iron cord, uh, or the extension uh, 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 cord. Discipline is training. It is teaching and practice. It's education and, and, and giving person a chance to apply. The action, the serving God, comes in our stewardship. And God helped us understand last week that if we are going to call ourselves Christian, we must also be stewards. It's not enough to be a disciple. You must be a steward. That brings us to James' letter to the churches. Now, like, like Paul, Paul writes to specific churches in specific locations. James is writing to them all. That at this particular time, churches do not exist like we have them now. They exist in homes. They were, they were anywhere between three to ten people large. 
and they were spread out throughout the Jewish di diaspora, that is the Mediterranean Sea, that is the Roman Empire, wherever there was a major place of economic, economy and trade, you were likely to find at least one Christian house church. And what has gotten back to James as an apostle, he's the brother of Jesus, he's the younger brother of Jesus, but he has become an apostle, and what has gotten back to James is that the people of God are not these students. <clears throat> that they are claiming faith without doing anything. And if that wasn't bad enough, the latest rumor that has gotten back to James is that the church is catering to the wealthy. That the church is going out seeking the wealthy, but forgetting about the poor, the downtrodden, the sick, the, those in prison. It is not living according to Matthew chapter 25, where Jesus says, when you fed the hungry, when you clothed the naked, when you gave shelter to the homeless, when you uh, healed the sick, when you visit those in prison, you have done it to me because you've done it to the least of them. Well, the church hasn't done it to the least of them. You know what, well, that's like, that's like us saying that we don't want just anybody in here. We're going to go uh, 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 pursue Hugh McCall, Michael Jordan, uh, uh, several other wealthy families, the, the Dukes, amen, several other wealthy families to bring them here. That we don't want the average person. We don't want someone who's going through trouble, who has issues, that is struggling, that has problems, that really needs God. We want persons that have it made, that have a pretty penny in their wallet and can write us checks, whatever we need, whatever we want. That is what was happening in the, in the churches at this time. And James is feeling the need to write to them and to straighten some things out. Amen. Praise God for a leader that even though he may not or she may not be around you uh, every day, is so in touch with you, cares about you so much that even in their absence, they're still sending you instruction and guidance on how to live the life that Christ Jesus has called us to live. And what we see here in this latter part of James uh, chapter 2, the second chapter of his letter. Amen. We see James reinforcing the need for Christians to be stewards. And we see him declaring very famously that faith without works is dead. That it does no good to run your mouth telling people what kind of Christian you are today. Let me, let me help you see if this sounds familiar. You know, I'm full of the Spirit. I'm sanctified. I'm Holy Ghost saved. You know, I'm, I'm fire purified. I, 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 I live by the Word of God. Me and God are close to one another. We see each other every day. We talk to each other every day. I make not a move without God. You know, all the rah-rah we hear from Christians nowadays. In fact, you have people, you go to different services and hear some sermons, and then you got to be in shape to hear their sermons because they want you to high-five someone. They want you to jump up and down. They want you to run around the church just so that you can declare that you are a Christian. But then you ask them, when are we going out to serve? And it gets awfully quiet. When we're going to feed, when we're going to minister, when we're going to tutor, when we're going to visit, when we're going to encourage, and then nowhere on their itineraries or any outreach ministry, but if you look at their calendar, it's full of preaching engagements. That's because we have gotten in a habit, in a mindset that Christ is not here to be served, but to serve us. And we are here, we've got this idea in our mind, what have you done for me lately, Jesus? Acting like we are part of Janet Jackson's Rhythm Nation. Telling God, what have you done for me lately? How have you, in other words, it ain't good enough, God, that you woke me up this morning. That you set me on my way. That you gave me warm blood cursing through my body. What have you done lately? There is $320 million in the lottery, God. All right. And my ticket hasn't hit yet. What have you done for me lately? 
God, I've been down to HR so many times applying for that supervisory job, and I still haven't got a job, God. What have you done for me lately? God, I went down and the Cadillac dealership has a brand new SUV and I looked at it, God, it smells good, it looks good. They even painted the, the color I want it to be with the, with the interior the way I want it to be. But what have you done for me lately, God? I got this spouse, God, I have these children, God, and I do everything I can for them. They still acting up, they still acting crazy. What have you done for me lately, God? I went to the doctor, God, and I, I've been paying my tithes. I come to Bible study. I come to Sunday school. I come to church. I sing all the songs of Pastor Al, even when he can't sing. And God, I still got a negative diagnosis and prognosis. What have you done for me lately? We have this mentality here amongst us where we are in the position where we think God must always give to us instead of us giving to others. And then we want to know and then we want to wonder why persons don't come to the church. They don't come because they don't see the church be what it's supposed to be. Guess what? You don't need so let me hold your Bible for a second Deacon, Deacon Styles. I'm giving it back to you. Amen. She looking like not by the Bible not by word. You're going to have it back. You know, you don't need to own a book to read the Bible anymore. You can go to Bible.com, BibleGateway.com, BibleStudy.com, BibleStudyTools.com, TheWord.com, and you can read this without ever going and buying one of these from Lifeway Christian Store or Barnes & Nobles. And guess what people are doing? People are actually going to the website and reading it so that they have an idea what to expect when they come here. And then they come here and they don't see us doing anything that God has told us to do. They read and they see, hear about Jesus and how Jesus would, 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 would detour his route. He made, it, the, the, if you read the stories, they always start off with Jesus was headed somewhere. In the midst of heading somewhere, he runs into someone and someone causes Jesus to detour. And Jesus obliges them. He detours. When the last time that we detoured for anyone? In fact, there's this one book I was reading during my dissertation. And, uh, and they said that Jesus' uh, uh, ministry is a ministry of interruptions. Amen. That every time you see Jesus, Jesus is being interrupted from something he wants to do. He's trying to pray. Here they come. He's trying to meditate. Here they come. He's trying to spend some time with disciples. Here they come. He's trying to spend time with family. Here they come. And you never see Jesus say no except one time. And even that one time, the Syrophoenician woman beats Jesus at his own game. And he still detours for her. And that's because Jesus understood that if you're going to serve God, you have to serve God as a steward as well as a disciple. And so when we're here today, we're, we, I know you may thought we're moving on. We're still in this uh, session uh, in, in this sermon series and if you're asking why we are, turn to someone and say, he's talking about me, that's why we can't leave yet. So y'all gonna say that. See, so y'all gonna tell, you, tell your neighbor it was your neighbor's fault. No, it's, it's our fault. It's our fault. We haven't served God the way we want to. And many of us are serving God with dead faith. In fact, I saw something on Facebook and I say to my phone because it's gonna show up on our Facebook page where it says, God, please clear out the dead work so that we may serve you faithfully. That's a prayer someone put together, made it a mem on Facebook, saying that they realize that they are full of dead work, dead faith. Faith without action. And so now someone, I know someone may be saying, okay, Pastor Al, if faith without works is dead, then how do we make faith work? How do we make it alive? How do we make it a living organism? Glad you asked. God has an answer. Give me the first point, Brother Rodney. Amen. Faith that gives and sustains life understands what James means by works when he declares that faith without works is dead. 
Now here's the interesting thing. When I said have the same work or works this morning, I'm sure you had an image or imagery came to your mind. I'm sure there's a certain image that you're thinking about as you are listening to me preach. And that image may be helping old Mrs. Johnson carry her groceries in from her car. It may be you keeping your eyes out on the neighborhood kids, understanding that when they get home from, from, from school, their parents are not around, and you're just keeping a general eye to make sure they're okay. It may be you collecting all the old clothes that you no longer want to wear that's in your closet, taking it down to Christ's assistant ministry, to Salvation Army, or Goodwill, and giving your old clothing and your gently used furniture to, to these places. Those are good, those are nice things to do, but that's not the work that God is looking for us to do. There's specific work that he's giving us an idea of what it is that he wants us to accomplish. There are good deeds that qualify as work. And we were talking about a little earlier, that is feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, giving shelter to the homeless, healing the sick, visiting the poor. Those five or six things, uh, there was one, I see my, I'm missing one more uh, in Matthew 25. And my, my biblical scholars, if you know it, call it out. Prison. In prison, visiting those in prison, there's those six things. And you know what, many churches, do set out to do those six things. But guess what, y'all? That list is not exclusive. That's not all Jesus did. Jesus gave inclusion to those who are ostracized and castigated. Do you know if you were born with a defect or you got sick, you were considered under judgment from God and people did not want you to even live in a neighborhood or community? They kicked you out of community and you had to live on the outskirts of town. Jesus went and spent time with those persons. You don't, you don't hear him uh, being at the country club or, or, or the nail shop or South Park in the Gucci store or the Fendi store. You hear him being in the places that many of us try to avoid each and every day. In fact, I dare to say to you that if you want to know what the works are, all you got to do is look at whatever Jesus did and mimic it. So guess what? Jesus spent time getting the leaders in order. When they challenged him, he challenged them back. In other words, he knew his words so they couldn't stump him. Some of us need to get spend some time with our word. That's active service. Some of us need to go places and be what people need to be so that they can function. Do you remember the woman at Nain? She lost her husband. She lost and did. She had lost her husband already, and she just lost her son. She lost her position in society. Women at this time were known by the husbands or the sons they had. When you lost your husband, you lost your son, you lost everything. But Jesus went and gave her back her son so that she would not be without anything. How many times have we given someone back their identity, given them back their purpose, given them back their integrity, given them back their reputation, given them back their status so that they may be who God has called them to be? Or, how, or, or are we spending time passing judgment on those we see? You know, they are where they are because guess what? They want to be there. You know what we say. If they really didn't want to be there, then they would take the help offered to them. Do you know some people can't recognize help when it's given to them because no one has helped them before? They don't have a model of help. And so you can't sit here and assume that they aren't taking their help because they don't want it. They don't know what help looks like, especially if everyone in their lives has been abusing them, using them, manipulating them, taking from them what they have. When they see you, they are like a small dog that has been hurt. They are in the fight or flight mode. And many times when we run into them, we back them into a corner. So yes, they come out barking. Yes, they come out biting because they're not sure what you're going to do. And they'd rather hurt you and risk losing it all than let you hurt them some more. 
And yet here we are, we are acting like the person in James. Hey, I hope you uh, have a good day and I hope you eat and I hope you get some clothes, but we're doing nothing to clothe and naked and clothe and feed people. I know God can do some miraculous stuff. I know God can multiply five loaves of bread and two fish and feed 15,000 people. I know that God can, can, can make, they can transform water to wine. But you notice in each one of those situations, there are servants there that are participating. Someone had to bring the food and the water to Jesus so that Jesus could multiply and transform it into the miracles. And even then, after he multiplies and transforms, someone then had to take the miracle and disseminate it to the public. Yes, yes, yes. Which means it's not enough to sit here on your ruler to the sand, please God, do something with them. Bless them so they get out of my face. No, you got to serve. You got to get up and you got to bring some things to Jesus. You got to let Jesus transform some things and then you need to take it back and give it to some people. Yes. Good deeds, works. This is what James is talking about. He says it's not good enough. Just because you can pat yourself on the back because you gave three little kids one scoop of ice cream on two years ago. You know, y'all sound like Al Bundy on the show. Al Bundy, 80 years old, talking about that one football game where he scored four touchdowns in the game. He, life has passed that by. But that's Al's claim to fame. And some of us are making the same kind of claim. Give me my second point. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Not only must we understand what James means when he says work, but we must also commit ourselves to actually performing this work. You know, I think there are some words in Christianity that just people despise. The first one is submit. When you say submit, especially to the sisters, some sisters, they get up saying, I ain't submitting to him. I, I got, God made me, I ain't got to submit. When the word is submit to one another. That's how it starts. It starts with submit to one another. It ends with submit to one another. It just so happens in the middle, Paul tells you what kind of submission to give. And sisters, if you're paying attention, all you have to do is love them and treat them as a head. But he has a harder job for you. You know that beautiful white dress that you all wore on, on your wedding gown? Day? You know, you went shopping for it. I mean, it took my wife 25 years to find her gown. I said, girl, if you don't get a gown, put something on, I'm just going to go on with my life. Amen. But she wanted to look just right on, on our wedding day. And boy, did she. She looked so good, she made me cry. In fact, when, when, the, when, the, when, when, when Benji started the service, he started off with the, with the question, well, do you take her? This started off, we hear, and I said, I do, I do, I do. And he had to say, wait a second, Doc, we're not that far. I'll let you know when you say I do. But she was wonderful. She was gorgeous. She was amazing on that day. She looked like everything I dreamed my bride would be. But guess what? God said, I don't judge you on the day you get her. I judge you on the day you bring her back to me. And can you bring her back to me looking the same way I gave her? That's what the submission requirements are for the brothers. That we got to love her and protect her in such a way that she's returned blemish free, spot free, wrinkle free. That she's returned looking just as beautiful as she did on, the, on their wedding day. This is why I can remember when I indi indicated we're having to enjoy marriage mission. He ran to me and said, thank you because I need some help making sure I present Wilhelmina back to God just as perfect as she is. Amen. That's, look at her smiling. Look at her smiling. <laughs> After two weeks of marriage, she's still smiling. Amen. 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 Brother Rimble looking at me like, boy, you wait to ask the church. I'm going to lay my hands on you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. But I think, I, I think there's some words that we don't like. Another one is commitment. We don't like commitment. Because commitment means we're going to have to be committed to something. That no matter if it's good or it's bad, we've got to stay connected to it. That if it, is, if it rises, if it falls, we have to remain connected to it. And you know, we live in a world that's looking for the next opportunity. In fact, that's what distinguishes institutions from opportunities. 
Opportunities are only good as well as they bless us, as well as they provide for us, as well as they benefit us. But once an opportunity has run its course, we leave that opportunity to look for another one. But institutions we are dedicated to, we're committed to, because an institution is bigger than an opportunity. Our HBCU, we, we, we celebrate CIAA, but I think we miss why the CIAA was there to begin with. Because the ACC did not include us. The SEC did not include us. The Big 10 did not include us. The Big 12 did not include us. So you know what we did? It's the CIAA, the SI, the CIAC, the MEAC, all these conferences developed so that our school will have collegiate competition just like our white counterparts. And we had, and, and what made that these schools, well, regardless of conference, what made them so notable is these were the institutions that took chances on us when no one else would. Because they were committed to ensuring that the next group of leaders for our race, for our community, would come through their door. But now when we see that, when we see the MEAP, when we see the CIAP, when we see the CIAA, all we see is a party. All we see is a chance to come from out of town and to shake our little money makers, to have some fun, to get in trouble, to drink too much, and to go home Sunday evening with a hangover. We don't see the commitment. And unfortunately, in the church, we don't see it either here, the commitment. In fact, I, we were talking, a group, a board and I were talking recently, and we were dealing with an issue, and amen, and the, uh, and, and the issue affects all of us, amen, and we were making some comments. And, but as I've been meditating this week, there's certain things that God has been hitting me in my head that says that why we are where we are and what we need to do to move forward. One of the things is, we got to learn how to be better connected to one another. Yes. That amen, we say we are members of, body, by, of the body of Christ, but we're like leaves that have fallen off the vine. And when the leaves have fallen off the vine, none of us are reaching down to gap, grab those leaves and say, hey, you need to get, excuse me, reconnected. We're just watching them die. Hoping that God is going to branch a new offspring from the vine and birth a new leaf. When God said there's leaves that we need to pick up and reconnect to the vine. Amen. So that those leaves may bear fruit. Amen. But the other thing that God spoke to me this week and said we're, is our commitment level. And I asked God, I said, why are we not as committed as we need to be? God, is, God said because we are afraid of commitment. He said, he said this is how far, this is how, how much we are afraid of commitment. We are so afraid of commitment that we would rather fail than succeed. Think about it. When we fail, persons no longer ask us to do anything. When we have a task and we go to complete it and we mess it up, we, we, we don't do it the way it's supposed to do, and we fail, what's the first thing someone says? I knew I shouldn't have given it to you. I should have given it to someone else. I would never ask you to do it again. And persons have gotten slick enough to know that if we don't want you to ask us to do anything else in the body of Christ, what we will do, we will do it as badly as we can. We will mess it up so that the response says, please, don't do it again. Don't touch it anymore. Now, let me go ahead and say it. I'm not trying to sing bad. I just can't sing. I, I really like to sing. Amen. My wife would tell you when we're in the car, I, I make her listen to my singing all the time. And so I don't want you to think Pastor Al is not committed to sing. Pastor Al is committed to singing. I just can't. I'm trying to make a distinction. There are some people that have the ability to do it. That can get it done. But they fail so that we won't have to do it. Dean Rimber asked me the other day to come help him clean up his garage. And so I said, I think about it. You know, so I was that's your garage. I got my own garage. I don't come to clean your garage. I need to clean mine. And so uh, I said to myself, all right, you know, when I go over there, I'm going to just make a mess. 
Amen. I'm going to make sure that the bottom of every box falls out. I'm going to make sure trash is everywhere. Because when I'm done, I won't even remember to say, please don't come back to my house anymore. I can do this myself next time. Amen. And, and, and people do that. Act that way. So to get out of it. In fact, I know some of us are now sitting thinking about all the ones the person that have failed in our lives. And we're sitting here asking ourselves, did they fail on purpose? And believe it or not, more people have failed on purpose than they have because of inability. And so many of us should go back to persons and say, hey, I know you're afraid of commitment. I know you're afraid of being committed to God. But I need you to understand that being committed to God is easier than you think. That committed, being committed to God means bringing to God what you have. You don't have to go above what you are, above what you have. All you have to do is bring it. And if you bring it, God will take it and God will use it. You don't have to fail. You don't have to put on a show to get out of it. In fact, you'll get more blessings of God if you try to be committed than you would if you try to remain disconnected from the body. And so guess what? You, all those people that you see that are always here all the time, I mean, amen, we can call them out by name. They're here because they're committed. There are certain persons that right now if I ask them to do something, they're going to roll their eyes and will be upset about it, but they are going to do it because they are committed to God and committed to this church. And they love God and they love this church and they understand this is an institution that God is going to use to bless someone. And so what they do, they, they put aside how they personally feel and they do it. In fact, that's what Jesus does. Do you think Jesus wanted to be involved with some of you colored people all the time? Do you think he wanted to have to multiply food all the time? Do you think he wanted to heal all the time? I bet Jesus went to the synagogue and said, I want to get a good word from Rabbi James. I want to get a good word from this person preacher or that preacher, but there were times he went and people said, Jesus is here. You know that boy can preach. Joseph's baby boy can get, can get a word out. And so here it is. He may not have wanted to preach. He may not have wanted to teach, but whenever they asked him to do so, he got himself up, he came to the front, and he gave them a word. That's what God is requiring from us. Commitment. In fact, let me ask you this question. Are you as committed to God as you are your favorite television show? Are you as committed to God, to coming to see God, as you are going to Mama's house every Thanksgiving? Are you as committed to God as you are your favorite football team? Praise God for the, for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. It's a shame when, when, when retired athletes have to come out of retirement to help the Dallas Cowboys do anything. I mean, the man was color commentating. He ain't caught a ball in years. And he has to come out of retirement. Oh, let me leave him alone. Amen. Because she's committed to her Dallas Cowboys. Amen. But are you as committed to God as she is to her Dallas Cowboys? Amen. Amen. Commitment. That's what God is requiring from us. And that's what enables us to do the work. Commitment. Give us the last point, Brother Rodney, and then we're going to go home. Amen. We always have to remember that God always gives us examples. We always have examples of how the Lord expects us to perform this work. In James' epistle, in this second half of the second chapter of James' epistle, he does not leave it to the church to figure it out how to exercise faith, how to demonstrate faith, how to give, the, give their good works. In fact, he gives them two examples. Two examples that these persons would know because they are famous examples. One is Abraham, the other is Rahab. Abraham, the father of many nations. You know how we say Abraham had many sons, and many sons had father Abraham. Well, guess what? That Abraham, amen. And, and throughout Abraham's life, we see Abraham exercise faith. He exercises faith when he leaves his father's house, his community, and his nation. And he goes to a place that God says, I'm going to tell you on the way. We see him exercise faith when he has to go rescue Lot because Lot has got himself in trouble, has lived in a land.
land where there's a war going on between two kings. We see him rescue Lot. We see him press God and challenge God about God's nature when Lot finds himself living in Sodom and Gomorrah and the evilness that was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. We see him exercise faith when he witnesses the three men, which are really God and two angels, really God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, walking up to, and he, he, he ministers to them, providing them a meal, providing them shelter. But the word of God is that faith is righteousness is not added to, to Abraham. He's not called righteous until the moment comes when he has to sacrifice Isaac. When he has to get his son, take him to Mount Moriah, lead him up the mountain, tie his son up, put his son on the altar, pull out the knife, and to bring it down to kill his son as a sacrifice of the Lord when the Lord stops him. That's when it's added. That's when righteousness is added to his name. And notice, it's not that Abraham didn't believe God because Abraham would have been in relationship with God for, for now more than 40 years. Isaac is not a six-year-old child as we've been led to believe. Isaac is about 18, 19, 20 years. So we're talking 20 years after the 25 years that they waited to have him. 45 years he's been walking with the Lord, but the Lord does not call him righteous until he does this one act. Where he puts his son on the line. He doesn't hold his son's life back from God. Rahab, a prostitute. Come on, y'all know what a prostitute is. She smacked it, flipped it, rubbed it down for some money. Amen. Amen. She she dropped it like it's hot. Come on now. I know Sister Candace looking at me. Oh my God, he's using that language. Here. She twerked it. She dropped it like it's hot for the next Benjamin. And here's the thing, we, you, you know how we feel about prostitutes. You know, we, we consider that those persons lowly persons because they are committing a crime against nature. They know that's the language we use in the courthouse when they're prosecuting prostitutes. But here it is, it was a prostitute. That same Joshua and Caleb. Remember when, when Moses sends the 12 out to spy the land out? And they and where they and what happened, they're in Rahab lives in Jericho. And Jericho is the first place they encounter. And the other ten come back and say, Hey, we look like grasshoppers to them. But Caleb and Joshua had a different experience. They were on the run. Word had gotten around that 12 spies from Israel were in the city. They knew that 10 had fled. There were two left. And they came to the prostitute house. It's amazing how when people want to find you, they know certain places that you're going to hang out. Okay, y'all want to act like y'all ain't been to a prostitute's house. Let me, let, 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 let me help you. Uh, uh, when you took your tithes and you went to uh, uh, Mark Kors, and you went to the Apple store, and you went to the Gucci store, the Louis Vuitton store, to Nemus Marcus, to, uh, to, to, to the mall, and you spent your time and money at the mall, you know you prostituted yourself. You visited the prostitute's house. Come on, tell the truth. Tell, tell, I know some of y'all look at me crazy. You know when you upset, and you don't get on your knees and pray, but the first thing you do, you go to that one bakery that has every kind of sweet that you like, every kind of confectionate that you like, and you are there buying money, feeding yourself, trying to feed your penny, saying that I'll feel better after you've been to a prostitute's house. Because you've been giving your dedication and your expectation of healing and recovering to a cake or a pie or, or a bunk cake or nothing but bunk cake or, or a Patty LaBelle's pie or an Oreo cookie cream pie or some peanut butter cookies. You've been giving your love to those things over there. You've been to a prostitute's house. And it's amazing when people are looking for you, they know which prostitute's house to come to. Come on, tell the truth. She wasn't the only prostitute. But she was the prostitute. And they came to her house looking for them. And they had got it right. It's just that Rahab feared their God more than she feared the men. And in demonstrating her fear of God, 
She was counted as righteous herself. She's counted as exercising faith herself. In fact, Rahab is one of only two people in Jesus' line. When you look at the line that are mentioned, that are women. One's Esther, one's Rahab. And guess what? Guess who Rahab's son, grandson is? No, David. One generation away is David. She is Jesus' great, 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 grandma. All right? But what happened, God gave them models. He wants them to see. And in both of the models he gives, someone's life is on the line. In other words, faith doesn't mean much until something that costs you everything is put on the line. And some of us have been thinking that we're exercising faith because we're giving out of our surplus, not the, 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 our main supply. And it's not until you find yourself having to give out of your main supply that you realize what it means to exercise faith. Do I give my last $10 to this person over here and I have nothing, or do I trust that the instant I give it away over here, God's going to give me something over here? You know one of the main reasons why God can't give you nothing? Because this is how you hold your hands. Now, no, now nothing falls out of your hand, but there's no space, there's no opening to put anything in your hand. And for some of us, some of us need to loosen up this hand so God can put some more in there. But here's a benefit for us, and I'm bringing this sermon to a close. I know someone said, well, what does that have to do with God always getting an example? We have, we have your Bible again. Thank you, appreciate it. In this Bible, praise God, this, oh gosh, she got a thick one too. She didn't get a thin line on it. Amen. One is, this is so heavy, I can use this as a dumbbell during the week. Like, praise God, the word. Woo, look at this word. I mean, it's so beautiful. It's tabbed and everything. But in this book, it's page after page of examples of how to be faithful. Page after page of example of how to say yes to God. Page after page of example of how to trust God. Page after page of persons who were just like you and I, who had nothing special about them. They weren't divine. They weren't necessary from a line, a privileged line, but they had trust. They had faith. And we see page after page of people saying, God, use me to your benefit. I can think of David right now. David was just a young shepherd boy in the field shepherding his father's sheep, but he didn't realize that shepherding sheep for his father, Jesse, was preparing him the shepherd sheep for his father the Lord God Almighty and when there was a giant a heathen named Goliath who came against the armies of the Lord and talked trash about God David found himself standing face to face or face to hill to this giant talking trash in his eye and you know it's one thing to talk trash my brother and my eye used to talk trash to this one guy that was in the neighborhood he was like 400 pounds in eighth grade, but no one wanted to get close to him because we were afraid that if he laid hands on us, he would kill us. And so we knew we would talk trash as we are bouncing around him. But David is this little midget, this little shrimp, and he's standing right there before Goliath. He said, you know what? Because you had nerve to talk trash about the armies of the living God, it'll be your head that comes off of your neck today, and it'll be your body that's given to the birds to eat. And sure enough, Goliath came with a sword. David came with some stones and he slung those stones and he killed a giant and with the giant's own sword, cut off the giant's head. I am thinking about Elijah. He's just a settler. All he did was settle. What they did, they built their tents and they sat in their tents all day long. But when God needed them to him to serve, he said yes. He went there and he declared the word of God to, to, to Jezebel and Ahab. Imagine what would happen if some of us went down to the White House today and trolled off uh, Cheetos exactly what the Lord thinks about him. Imagine how quickly we would be arrested. That is just what Elijah was up against. And then the uh, J, uh, Ahab and Jezebel put a put a put a, uh, a, a price on his head. 
dead or alive, preferably dead. And we see Elijah always serve God. He went where God needed him to go. He blessed who God needed him to bless. And when it came time at Mount Carmel for them to go against all those prophets of Baal and Asherah, Elijah stood his ground. Elijah that day chose God and God gave Elijah a powerful witness that we are still telling today. Think about Moses. All Moses wanted to do was to get away from Egypt. He never wanted to go back to Egypt. But God called him one day and said, not only am I sending you back to Egypt to lead my people out of Egypt, but that you are going to be the first pastor of a Christian congregation. You are going to be responsible for ministry and shepherding four million people and I'm going to be with you every step of the way and every step of the way God showed, used Moses God showed up in Moses' life in fact they said God was so present on Moses in Moses' life that when Moses came and interacted with the people the people said please put on a veil because the reflection of God is too much for to say I, I wish I had some people to understand you don't even want need to be in the presence of God sometimes you just need the reflection of God because the reflection of God is so powerful that the reflection itself can make some things happen in your life. But I know you may be saying, but Pastor Al, these are just everyday people. These are normal people. I need someone that can overcome normal. I need someone that's supernatural. Okay, then you have another example in Jesus. Here is Jesus that came 40 and two generations came down from heaven, down here to earth, and he walked with us. He talked with us, and he told us that we're on his own. And not only did he tell us that we're in his own, he showed us that we're in his own. He fed us when we couldn't feed ourselves. He clothed us when we couldn't clothe ourselves. He gave us homes when we didn't have homes. He provided jobs and opportunities. He opened doors that no one can open, and he closed doors that no one can close. He gave sight to the blind. He gave hearing to the Death. He gave speech to the mute. He gave, he gave the ability to get up and walk and to carry things. The persons who were crippled, lame, dumb, and insane. He did an abundance of things. And even when everything he had done should have been enough, it should have been enough for us to be able to move forward in faith. God then called upon him to make the ultimate sacrifice. God called him to get up on the cross and die for us. And unlike many of us who would say, God, I have to draw a limit in the sand. You can ask me to multiply food. You can ask me to heal the sick. But I will not shed blood for any of them over there. Jesus said not a mumbling word. He got up on the cross. He hung there for as long as it took. And even when it been dying with his body attached to that cross, he did so that you and I may have eternal life. That our sins may not hold us back. Our sins may not hold us down. That people will be able to see that faith with good works is life. That we have life in Jesus because we have both faith in him and the good works he did. So if there's ever a time when we need a model of what it means to serve, we have that model in God. If we need encouragement, we have a model of encouragement. If we need inspiration, we have a model of inspiration. If we need fortitude, we have a model of fortitude. If we need integrity, we have a model of integrity. If we need character, we have a model of character. If we need trust, we have a model of trust. There's nothing that we need that God has not given us and shown us through the example and model of Jesus. Someone ought to be thanking God that God has laid it out, that God has made it easy, that God has made it so we can exercise faith in a way that brings him glory in a way that's easy for us. I don't want God saying to you, or to any of us, your faith is dead. I want God to say to us what he said to those two servants when he came and he counted. Good job, my good, well done, my good and faithful servant. You who have been faithful over a little bit, and now here, understand that. That's not faith believing, that's faith serving over a little bit. Come into your Father's heaven and enjoy much. That's what I want God to say over each and every one of us. And it's my prayer today that as you live this week, you live a faith that is lived out, that is served, that is actionable 
so that God can say it to you. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's do this.